Chapter 1 of The Chessmen of Mars. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dustin A.K. Tabais, recorded in Dallas, Texas. Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 1 Tara in a Tantrum. Tara of Helium rose from the pile of silks and soft furs upon which she had been reclining, stretched her lithe body languidly, and crossed toward the center of the room where above a large table a bronze disc depended from the low ceiling. Her carriage was that of health and physical perfection, the effortless harmony of faultless coordination. A scarf of silken gossamer crossing over one shoulder was wrapped around her body. Her black hair was piled high upon her head. With a wooden stick she tapped upon the bronze disc lightly, and presently the summons was answered by a slave girl who entered smiling, to be greeted similarly by her mistress. "'Are my father's guests arriving?' asked the princess. "'Yes, Tara of Helium, they come,' replied the slave. "'I have seen Kantos Khan, overlord of the navy, and Prince Saran of Patharth, and Jor Kantos, son of Kantos Khan.' She shot a roguish glance at her mistress as she mentioned Jor Kantos' name. "'And, oh, there were others. Many have come.' "'The bath, then, Uthia,' said the mistress." And why, Uthia, she added, do you look thus and smile when you mention the name of Jorkantos? The slave girl laughed gaily. It is so plain to all that he worships you, she replied. It is not plain to me, said Tara of Helium. He is the friend of my brother, Carthoris, and so he is here much, but not to see me. It is his relationship for Carthoris that brings him thus often to the palace of my father. Carthoris is hunting in the north with Talu, Shedek of Okar, Uthia reminded her. My bath, Uthia, cried Tar of Helium, that tongue of yours will bring you to some misadventure yet. The bath is ready, Tar of Helium, the girl responded, her eyes still twinkling with merriment, for she well knew that in the heart of her mistress was no anger that could displace the love of the princess for her slave. Preceding the daughter of the warlord, she opened the door of an adjoining room where lay the bath, a gleaming pool of scented water in a marble basin. Golden stanchions supported a chain of gold encircling it and leading down into the water on either side of marble steps. A glass dome let in the sunlight, which flooded the interior, glancing from the polished white of the marble walls in the procession of bathers and fishes, which, in conventional design, were inlaid with gold in a broad band that encircled the room. Tara of Helium removed the scarf from around her and handed it to the slave. Slowly she descended the steps to the water, the temperature of which she tested with a symmetrical foot, undeformed by tight shoes and high heels. A lovely foot, as God intended that feet should be and seldom are. Finding the water to her liking, the girl swam leisurely to and fro about the pool. With the silken ease of the seal she swam, now at the surface, now below her smooth muscles rolling softly beneath her clear skin, a wordless song of health and happiness and grace. Presently she emerged and gave herself into the hands of the slave girl, who rubbed the body of her mistress with a sweet-smelling semi-liquid substance contained in a golden urn, until the glowing skin was covered with a foamy lather, then a quick plunge into the pool, a drying with soft towels, and the bath was over. Typical of the life of the princess was the simple elegance of her bath. No retinue of useless slaves, no pomp, no idle waste of precious moments. In another half hour her hair was dried and built into the strange but becoming coiffure of her station. Her leathern strappings, encrusted with golden jewels, had been adjusted to her figure, and she was ready to mingle with the guest that had been bidden to the midday function at the palace of the warlord. As she left her apartments to make her way to the gardens where the guests were congregating, two warriors, the insignia of the house of Prince of Helium upon their harness, followed a few paces behind her. Grim reminders that the assassin's blade may never be ignored upon Barsoom, where in measure it counterbalances the great natural span of human life, which is estimated at not less than a thousand years. As they neared the entrance to the garden, another woman, similarly guarded, approached them from another quarter of the great palace. As she neared them, Tara of Helium turned toward her with a smile and a happy greeting, while her guards knelt with bowed heads in willing and voluntary adoration of their beloved Helium. 
Thus always, solely at the command of their own hearts, did the warriors of Helium greet Dejah Thoris, whose deathless beauty had more than once brought them to bloody warfare with other nations of Barsoom. So great was the love of the people of Helium for their mate of John Carter, it amounted practically to worship, as though she were indeed the goddess that she looked. The mother and daughter exchanged the gentle Barsoomian car of greeting and kissed. Then together they entered the gardens where the guests were. A huge warrior drew his short sword and struck his metal shield with the flat of it, the brazen sound ringing out above the laughter in the speech. The princess comes, he cried, Dejah Thoris, the princess comes, Terra of Helium. Thus always is royalty announced. The guest arose. The two women inclined their heads. The guards fell back upon either side of the entranceway. A number of nobles advanced to pay their respects. The laughing and the talking were resumed, and Dejah Thoris and her daughter moved simply and naturally among their guests, no suggestion of differing rank apparent in the bearing of any who were there. Though there was more than a shingle jeddak and many common warriors whose only title lay in brave deeds or noble patriotism, Thus it is only Mars where men are judged upon their own merits rather than upon those of their grandsires, even though pride of lineage be great. Tara of Helium let her slow gaze wander among the throng of guests until presently it halted upon one she'd sought. Was the faint shadow of a frown that crossed her brow an indication of displeasure at the sight that met her eyes, or did brilliant rays of noonday sun distress her? Who may say? She had been reared to believe that one day she should wed Jor Kantos, son of her father's best friend. It had been the dearest wish of Kantos Khan and the warlord that this should be, and Terra of Helium had accepted it as a matter of all but accomplished fact. Jor Kantos had seemed to accept the matter in the same way. They had spoken of it casually as something that would, as a matter of course, take place in the indefinite future, as, for instance, his promotion in the Navy, in which he was now a padwar, or the set functions of the court of her grandfather, Tardos Morse, Jadak of Helium, or death. They had never spoken of love, and that had puzzled Tara of Helium upon the rare occasion she gave it thought, for she knew that people who were to wed were usually much occupied with the matter of love, and she had all of a woman's curiosity. She wondered what love was like. She was very fond of Jorkantos, and she knew that he was very fond of her. They like to be together, for they like the same things, and the same people, and the same books, and their dancing was a joy, not only to themselves, but to those who watched them. She could not imagine wanting to marry anyone other than Jorkantos. So perhaps it was only the sun that made her brows contract just the tiniest bit at the same instant that she discovered Jorkantos sitting in earnest conversation with Olvia Marthus, daughter of Jed of Hastor. It was Jor Kanto's duty to immediately pay his respects to Dejah Thoris and Tara of Helium, but he did not do so, and presently the daughter of the warlord frowned indeed. She looked long at Olvia Marthus, and though she had seen her many times before and knew her well, she looked at her today through new eyes that saw apparently for the first time that the girl from Hastor was noticeably beautiful even among those other beautiful women of Helium. Tara of Helium was disturbed. She attempted to analyze her emotions, but found it difficult. Olvia Marthus was her friend. She was very fond of her, and she felt no anger towards her. Was she angry at Jor Kantos? No, she finally decided that she was not. It was merely surprised then that she felt. Surprised that Jor Kantos could be more interested in another than in herself. She was about to cross the garden and join them when she heard her father's voice directly behind her. Tara of Helium, he called, and those turned to see him approaching with a strange warrior whose harness and metal bore devices with which she was unfamiliar. Even among the gorgeous trappings of the men of Helium and the visitors from distant empires, those of the stranger were remarkable for their barbaric splendor. The leather of his harness was completely hidden beneath ornaments of platinum thickly set with brilliant diamonds, as were the scabbards of his sword and the ornate holster that held his long Martian pistol. Moving through the sunlit garden at the side of the great warlord, the scullient rays of his countless gems enveloping him as in an aerial of light imparted to his noble figure a suggestion of godliness. Terra of Helium, I bring you Gahan, 
Jed of Gathol, said John Carter, after a simple Barsoomian custom of presentation. Kor, Gohan, Jed of Gothol, returned Tara of Helium. My sword is at your feet, Tara of Helium, said the young chieftain. The warlord left them, and the two seated themselves upon an earthseat bench beneath the spreading Sorapus tree. Far Gathol, mused the girl. Ever in my mind has it been connected with mystery and romance and the half-forgotten lore of the ancients. I cannot think of Gathol as existing today, possibly because I have never before seen a Gatholian, and perhaps, too, because of the great distance that separates Helium and Gathol, as well as the comparative insignificance of my little free city, which might easily be lost in one corner of mighty Helium, added Gahan. But what we lack in power we make up in pride, he added, laughing. We believe ours is the oldest inhabited city upon Barsoom. It is one of the few that has retained its freedom, and this despite the fact that its ancient diamond mines are the richest known, and unlike practically all the other fields, are today apparently as inexhaustible as ever. Tell me of Gathol, urged the girl. The very thought fills me with interest. Nor was it likely that the handsome face of the young Jed detracted anything from the glamour of far Gathol. Nor did Gahan seem displeased with the excuse for further monopolizing the society of his fair companion. His eyes seemed chained to her exquisite features, from which they moved no farther than to a rounded breast, part hid beneath its jeweled covering, a naked shoulder, or the symmetry of a perfect arm, resplendent in bracelets of barbaric magnificence. Your ancient history has doubtless told you that Gathol was built upon an island in Thruxus, mightiest of the five oceans of old Barsoom. As the ocean receded, Gathol crept down the sides of the mountain, the summit of which was the island upon which she had built. Until today, she covers the slopes from summit to base, while the bowels of the great hill are honeycombed with the galleries of her mines. Entirely surrounding us is the great salt marsh, which protects us from invasion by land, while the rugged and oft-times vertical topography of our mountain renders the landing of hostile airships a precarious undertaking. That and your brave warriors, suggested the girl. Gahan smiled. We do not speak of that except to enemies, he said, and then with tongues of steel rather than of flesh. But what practice in the art of war has the people which nature has thus protected from attack? asked Tara of Helium, who had liked the young Jed's answer to her previous question, but yet in whose mind persisted a vague conviction of the possible effeminacy of her companion, induced doubtless by the magnificence of his trappings and weapons which carried a suggestion of splendid show rather than grim utility. Our natural barriers, while they have doubtless saved us from defeat on countless occasions, have not by any means rendered us immune from attack, he explained, for so great is the wealth of Gathol's diamond treaty that there yet may be found those who will risk almost certain defeat in an effort to loot our unconquered city. So thus we will find occasional practice in the exercise of arms, but there is more to Gathol than the mountain city. My country extends from Polonana, equator, north ten karads, and from the 10th Karad west of Hors to the 20th west, including thus a million square hods, and greater proportion of which is fine grazing land, where run our great herds of throats and zitatars. Surrounded as we are by predatory enemies, our herdsmen must indeed be warriors, or we should have no herds, and you may be assured they get plenty of fighting. Then there is our constant need of workers in the mines. The Gatholians consider themselves a race of warriors, and as such prefer not to labor in the mines. The law is, however, that each male Gatholian shall give an hour a day in labor to the government. That is practically the only tax that is levied upon them. They prefer, however, to furnish a substitute to perform this labor. And as our own people will not hire out for labor in the mines, it has been necessary to obtain slaves. And I do not need to tell you that slaves are not one without fighting. We sell these slaves in the public market, the proceeds going half and half to the government and the warriors who bring them in. The purchasers are credited with the amount of labor performed by the particular slaves. At the end of a year, a good slave will have performed the labor tax of his master for six years. And if slaves are plentiful, he is freed and permitted to return to his own people. You fight in platinum and diamonds, asked Terra, indicating his gorgeous trappings with a quizzical smile. 
Gahan laughed. We are a vain people, he admitted good-naturedly, and it is possible that we place too much value on personal appearances. We vie with one another in the splendor of our accoutrements when trapped for the observance of the lighter duties of life, though when we take the field of our leather in the plainest I have ever seen worn by fighting men of Barsoom, we pride ourselves too upon our physical beauty, and especially upon the beauty of our women. May I dare to say, Tara of Helium, that I am hoping for the day when you will visit Gathol, that my people may see one who is really beautiful. The women of Helium are taught to frown with displeasure upon the tongue of the flatterer, rejoined the girl, but Jahan, Jed of Gathol, observed that she smiled as she said it. A bugle sounded, clear and sweet, above the laughter and the talk. The dance of Barsoom, exclaimed the young warrior. I claim it for you, Tower of Helium. The girl danced in the direction of the bench where she had last seen Jorkantos. He was not in sight. She inclined her head in assent to the claim of the Gatholian. Slaves were passing among the guests, distributing small musical instruments of a single string. Upon each instrument were characters which indicated the pitch and length of its tone. The instruments were of skeel, the string of gut, and were shaped to fit the left forearm of the dancer, to which it was strapped. There was also a ring wound with gut, which was worn between the first and second joints of the index finger of the ring hand, and which, when passed over the string of an instrument, elicited the single note required of the dancer. The guests had ridden, and were slowly making their way toward the expanse of scarlet sword at the south end of the gardens where the dance was to be held, when Jorkantos came hurriedly toward Terra of Helium, I claim, he exclaimed as he neared her, but she interrupted him with a gesture. You're too late, Jorcanto, she cried in mock anger. No laggard may claim Tar of Helium, but haste now, lest thou lose also Elvia Marthus, whom I have never seen wait long to be claimed for this or any other dance. I have already lost her, admitted Jorcanto ruefully. And you mean to say that you've come for Tara of Helium only after having lost Olvia Marthus? demanded the girl, still simulating displeasure. Oh, Tara of Helium, you know better than that, insisted the young man. Was it not natural that I should assume that you would expect me, who alone has claimed you for the dance of Barsoom, for the least twelve times past, and sit and play with my thumbs until you saw fit to come for me? she questioned. Ah, no, Jorkantos, Tar of Helium is for no laggard, and she threw him a sweet smile and passed on toward the assembling dancers with Gahan, Jed of Fargathol. The dance of Barsoom bears a relation similar to the more formal dancing functions of Mars and that the Grand March does to ours, though it is infinitely more intricate and more beautiful. Before a Martian youth of either sex may attend an important social function, where there is dancing, he must have become proficient in at least three dances, the dance of Barsoom, his national dance, and the dance of his city. In these three dances, the dancers furnish their own music, which never varies, nor do the steps or figures vary, having been handed down from time immemorial. All Barsoomian dances are stately and beautiful, but the dance of Barsoom is a wondrous epic of motion and harmony, there is no grotesque posturing, no vulgar or suggestive movements. It has been described as the interpretation of highest ideals of a world that aspired to grace and beauty and chastity in woman, and strength and dignity and loyalty in man. Today John Carter, warlord of Mars, and Dejah Thoris, his mate, led in the dancing, and if there was another couple that veed with them in possession of the silent admiration of the guests, it was the resplendent Jed of Gathol and his beautiful partner. In the ever-changing figures of the dance, the man found himself now with the girl's hand in his, and again with an arm about the lithe body and the jeweled harness, but inadequately covered. And the girl, though she had danced a thousand dances in the past, realized for the first time the personal contact of a man's arm against her naked flesh, it troubled her that she should notice it, and she looked up questioningly and almost with displeasure at the man as though it was his fault. Their eyes met, and she saw in his that which she had never seen in the eyes of Jorkantos. It was suddenly at the very end of the dance, and they both stopped suddenly with the music and stood there looking straight into each other's eyes. It was Gahan of Gathol who spoke first. Tara of Helium, I love you, he said. The girl drew herself to her full height. The Jed of Gathol forgets himself. 
she exclaimed haughtily. The jet of Gothol would forget everything but you, Tara of Helium, he replied. Fiercely, he pressed the soft hand that he still retained from the last position of the dance. I love you, Tara of Helium, he repeated. Why should your ears refuse to hear what your eyes but just now did not refuse to see and answer? What meanest thou, she cried. Are the men of Gathol such boars, then? They are neither boars nor fools, he replied quietly. They know when they love a woman, and when she loves them. Tara of Helium stamped her little foot in anger. Go, she said, before it is necessary to acquaint my father with the dishonor of his guest. She turned and walked away. Wait, cried the man, just another word. Of apology, she asked. Of prophecy, he said. I do not care to hear it, replied Tara of Helium, and left him standing there. She was strangely unstrung, and shortly thereafter returned to her own quarter of the palace, where she stood for a long time by a window, looking out beyond the scarlet tower of Great Helium toward the northwest. Presently she turned angrily away. I hate him, she exclaimed aloud. Whom, inquired the privileged Uthia? Tara of Helium stomped her foot. That ill-mannered boar, the jet of Gathol, she replied. Uthia raised her slim brows. At the stamping of the little foot, a great beast rose from the corner of the room and crossed the Tutar of Helium, where it stood looking up into her face. She placed her hand upon the ugly head. Dear old Woola, she said, no love could be deeper than yours, yet it never offends. Would that men might pattern themselves after you. End of chapter 1